Hello, everyone. I am Leslie Levy, the Executive Director of the International Quilt Museum located at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. I'm the International Quilt Museum proudly stewards and exhibits the world's largest collection of quilts and related textiles. It spans five centuries and over 65 countries. In fact, that's our mission and our passion um, to build a global collection and audience that celebrates the cultural and artistic significance of quilts. Uh, we have a great program for you today. Um, you saw some of the video um, thanking our sponsors, but I wanna publicly um, acknowledge those organizations that bring you textile talks each week. Um, in addition to the International Quilt Museum, the Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, Sakwa and Service Design Association, all join together to bring you this free programming. Um, so if you find it helpful and inspiring, um, we want to enjoy you, invite you to join us if you um, so are inclined um, and want to help sponsor us, we would love that as well too. Um, just a couple housekeeping reminders um, for any of you who are new to Textile Talks. Um, please use the Q&A for your questions. Um, many of you, the chat box is for greeting one another's. Um, there will be a survey later for um, any of your comments or suggestions on how we can improve. Um, and I will also let you know, some of you may have already seen it. Um, we do caption the textile talks um, to make that accessible to a wider audience. If you prefer not to view the captions, please feel free to turn those off. We have a fun program for you today. Um, it is Dr. Marin Hansen, who is the international curator of our collections here at the museum, in conversation with Gita Kandawal from Mumbai, India. She, um, we just opened her new exhibition called Miniature Costumes and Quilts, Gita Candlewall's Labor of Love. Um, and so we have a taped program for you today. Those two are in conversation about how Gita produced all of these fabulous miniature costumes. Um, it's really amazing. I will let you know that the program is pretty long. It's about 50 minutes, 52 minutes. So um, we may not have as much time at the end for answering your questions. So I'm gonna put my email um, in the Q&A function, okay? So if you have a question um, and want to email me directly, you are welcome to do that. And we will answer your questions um, just as soon after the program as we possibly can. Um, I'm also hoping we might have a minute or two at the end to show you a couple photos of the exhibition because it's gorgeous. I'm biased, but it's gorgeous. And um, Lucy will also put in the chat function um, a link so that you can take a 3D tour of the exhibition. So um, 
I know I've gone through a lot here very, very quickly, um, but I want us to go ahead and get started. And Lucy, if you will, go ahead and start the video and we'll get ready with our program. So welcome everyone. Hello, and welcome to today's Textile Talk. My name is Marin Hansen. I am Curator of International Collections at the International Quilt Museum. And it is my great pleasure today to be talking with Gita Candlewall. And we are speaking with Gita today because the International Quilt Museum is featuring some of her work, her handiwork in an exhibition called Miniature Costumes and Quilts, Gita Candlewall's Labor of Love. And it is on view March 31st to October 14th of this year. I hope uh, any of you out in the listening audience, viewing audience, if you have a chance to get to Lincoln, Nebraska, we would love to have you come and see Gita's costume costumes and quilts. Uh, they're really, truly magnificent. And we will be showing you several examples of them in our talk today. I'd first like to introduce Gita. Gita Candlewall, a globally recognized quilt maker and a textile enthusiast, lives in Mumbai, India. She has been passionately involved in quilt making for over four decades. Over the years, she has participated in many quilt ex exhibitions around the world, such as the International Quilt Festival in Houston, Texas, and the European Patchwork Meeting in Alsace, France. She also served on the International Quilt Museum's International Advisory Board for more than a decade. In 2013, she published Godri's of Maharashtra, which is, uh, is from the Quilt Mania editions. Uh, they were the publishers. Uh, it was the first extensive examination of quilts from her home state of Maharashtra. Over the years, Candlewall has traveled to many of India's diverse regions, collecting local textiles along the way. She incorporated some of these fabrics into the group of over 50 miniature costumes she created over a three year period. And that is uh, the main topic of our textile talk today. So welcome Gita, we're so happy to have you with us today. Thank you, Marin. It is a great privilege and a great pleasure to be answering some of your questions and uh, talking about quilt making and costume making. We are so happy to have you here and we are always pleased to be able to collaborate with you again, which we have done many times over the years. So getting started, uh, I wanted to dive right in, but first, before we start talking about your miniature costume, quilts, you've had this long, rich history relating to quilts. And I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you got started with quilt making in the very beginning. I think quilt making is because I'm instinctively drawn towards fabrics. My grandfather, who had a cloth shop in Amritsar, I would visit him and play with the um, uh, scraps that were lying around. And those scraps or fabrics had their own distinctive nature, their distinctive scent, and uh, a kind of feeling for a child to have a lot of imagination. As I grew up uh, in the 50s, after India's independence, uh, Pupul Jekar, a lady uh, uh, who was well known in India for the revival of traditional crafts and village handicrafts, promoted and uh, uh, was a, a, a mentor to many of us. Uh, 
I think it was also a lot of luck as I was making quilts. A Swedish company approached me to make my first quilts and thereafter it became a business uh, for almost 28 to 30 years with repeat orders from El Corte Angles, from Switzerland, from Scandinavian countries. For me, it has been an amazing journey in discovering myself through quilt making and through fabrics to also to learn about the climate conditions and how the light or the sunlight reflects the interiors. The colors would change uh, in quilt making. Uh, and it continued for 28 years till I thought I should move on to to researching my own backyard in Maharashtra about quilts. Mm. Mm. And, and that's an, an, that's our next amazing story that we will get to. I wanted to show a couple of your own quilts though. And, and if you could just briefly tell us the story of, of Shantabai stitching her Godri and your life of Gandhi quilts. They're both really amazing, amazing um, story quilts. And uh, before we move on to your documentation project, I, I'd love to hear about these two. Uh, Shantabai is an expression of a village woman who I was fascinated by. She was making godris in a nearby village called Lonavla. Uh, inside her hut, uh, it was just a one-room hut with a cow, with her little temple, with her cooking vessels, and always smiling. She was a happy quilter. Uh, so when I came back, I thought I must uh, share my feelings in a quilt and express her joy in quilt making. Uh, uh, if you notice, uh, she's well dressed, she's got her bindi, she's got her bangles on a Mangal Sutra and a very typical Maharashtran sari and a Maharashtran blouse. Uh, it has been a fascinating journey uh, discovering uh, uh, Maharashtran Godaris because I realized that uh, many of them make it as a, a home consumption, as a recycling of their own saris and blouses for their families, for their children, for their guests. Uh, one of the ladies said that we give the most uh, soiled and torn quilt to the newly wed woman or bride so that she can learn to make her own quilts as she comes along. Oh, that's a nice story. Yeah. Generation, <laughs> generation, uh, generation. Yes. Uh, and I learned from them and understood their way of working, their techniques, their handicaps, and their strengths. 
Of course, they don't use any tools such as a measuring tape or a, even a scissors or um, a measuring tape. It's uh, uh, they they use the palm of their hands or the uh, their body parts or a stone to put the quilt flat on the ground. Mm. And for me, it was a new experience because I had learned to quilt in the traditional American and English ways. Mm. So, uh, they don't add any acrylic or foam or cotton in their quilts, but the inside layers are opened out trousers or opened out saris, mm. five or six layers, and they're heavy. They can be up to five kilos per quilt. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they don't go shopping. If they need to buy thread or some kind of embellishments, when their husband goes into town to to market their thread, he just brings bundles of uh, thread, uh, which is in a how you call it in a not in a roll but in uh, in a skein, mm -hmm. and it's rough cotton thread, not mercerized, not shining. Right. So they right. use very thick cotton thread and very thick needles, no thimbles to quilt their quilts. You know, you're telling us really amazing, interesting information about the research and documentation you did. So I, I think we should move on to some of the slides that really show what you're talking about. Um, it, the, the photographs you took out in the field as you were doing this research, they're just amazing. But I first just wanted to mention again your book, The Godris of Maharashtra. Um, it's really the, the first and only um, intensive documentation of the quilts of your, your home state of Maharashtra. And uh, the, the field work you did was, was really amazing. Can you just briefly tell us about going out uh, into the hinterlands of Maharashtra? How many trips did you make? And what, what did the logistics look like for you? Uh, shall I say it was out of boredom, perhaps? <laughs> but, but my passion and my learning drove me over three years to the different parts of Maharashtra, making almost 35 trips, not knowing where I would spend the night. Sometimes uh, we would have to carry our own petrol because petrol pumps were not visible. We would always carry our chapatis and water, not knowing exactly where we would end up. Uh, when I say we, I had a translator because I don't speak Marathi. I had a photographer and a driver who would try to uh, find little villages off the main road and try and make uh talk make conversation because many of the villagers were hesitant and suspicious about uh, a city person coming in a big car right. wanting to know about their lives right. um, in one of the villages i said why are you afraid she said are you a politician are you looking for votes? I said, no, I'm trying to document a book, but they'd never heard of such a thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I would like to photograph, but they're not easily 
uh, happy about giving their photographs mm. to unknown people because they believe that it could be not witchcraft but uh, unauspicious mm. right right this I mean, woman here looks slightly hesitant to have her photo taken and uh, yes and you can see that her finger is tied around with a cloth while she's quilting and she's cutting with a used blade she told me from her husband's uh, shaving blade and they would slit the the fabric and then turn it into these triangles a very interesting method of uh, making triangles without cutting with the scissors absolutely and the, the what that ends up looking like is a quilt like this one right yes and uh, in maharashtra most of them do uh, um, uh, uh, rectangles or squares and i think they said to me that the triangles uh, are mountains for them uh -huh. indicate mountains they look uh, like um, ranges following one after another mountain ranges off into the distance also uh, they start quilting from the periphery from the outside uh -huh. and that i found uh, unlike what we do we start quilting from the center and go outward right but they would go towards the center and then put a pocket with jewelry uh, rice dried uh, rice kumkum and haldi uh, turmeric and then pray to the goddess annapurna uh, who would give them a full stomach right through the ear. So every quilt the, was auspicious. Yes, and it meant a lot to them. Uh, they would wash them twice a year in the river, once during Holi in March, and then again in uh, at Diwali time during october hmm. and the uh, the auspicious rice and uh, kumkum haldi would remain there it's it did not disturb them to remove it and put it back again so oh, wow. it was just when they finished a quilt they would make a little prayer okay the one with the disney is very interesting because yeah. it's a full sheet and i think they had already gotten to television that year and found something in the local market uh -huh. which the husband brought back and they used it as the backing of a quilt it's so interesting <laughs> to have the, those rather unusual i would have accepted expected old saris or some old fabric but this was uh, charming so, yeah, when I wanted to buy, when I wanted to buy something from them, one of them said, we are not that poor that we have to sell our old clothes to you. <laughs> they refused to sell. And ah. they said it's for home consumption. So it was, uh, it was uh, talking to them, sitting there for hours, trying to convince them uh that they could make another quilt but if i could take one as a sample home they said are you going to resell it or are you going to copy it what is the purpose of buying these quilts oh uh, yeah well i mean as you said they were uh you were a city person coming out into their part of the the country countryside and they were a little bit yeah suspicious perhaps and I mean, I would too, if someone came into my oh. home and wanted to ask me questions, I would perhaps also feel suspicious. Yeah. 
yeah. and and not readily and not readily want to be friends with them right now um in this next slide i remember you telling me one time about the uh, why some of the fabrics in this quilt are so special or why they are regionally significant Uh, this is in a larger town called Sholapur, and perhaps the late the quilter was working for a wealthy woman whose saris and dupattas and kurtas have been opened up to use because they look like a little bit more fashionable fabric printed. In, they don't look only like saris. She has used sari borders. Um, as you can see, again, a rectangle. But the printed fabric seems to have come from her, uh, her not boss, but from the lady she worked with, a domestic worker, helper uh, at home. Right. And you were talking earlier about um, the annual cleaning or washing of the quilts. And I think the photo on the left is maybe of a woman who um, either was transporting them or maybe she was she coming home from washing her quilts or going to wash them? Going to wash, going uh -huh. to wash. Right, right. And they're I always well-dressed. I really admire that you know with the nose ring uh, <laughs> she she doesn't look suspicious this woman she looks like she's very happy to have you come visit <laughs> uh, uh, i think her nephew was with me that year and she she's doing a bit of quilting here and um that's what can you tell you told me once about the the tattoo on her arm yes the tattoo is her husband's name okay and happily they uh do it when as soon as they are going to be married or just married okay and she she looks like a very happy quilter yes and this one is very uh, unique because you rarely see writing on Indian quilts the way you see it here. Yes, that's what interested me. And when I asked the lady who made it, she said her daughter had just started to go to school. She was about 15 years old and could actually read and write a little bit so she the girl wanted her name written on the quilt uh -huh. and this is a child's quilt so i think they made it for her younger sister her name is neelam goje rather unusual but the colors are very primary and simple uh, design yeah, it's, it's a beautiful quilt I, and I love that her name, it seems so, she seemed, the, the mother must have been very proud to put her daughter's name on there. To have an educated child in the family is right. definitely uh, a pride for the family and for the village, for the right. whole village. And these folks are, I, I believe, in Pune? Pune. Uh, again, mountains in a different way on the right, uh, all uh, concentrating to the center. Mm. And this one also a rectangular quilt starting. And it got little triangles at the end, which when you fold a square, you get a triangle like that. All oh, right. What uh, I think American quilt makers would call those prairie points, the little, yeah. the little uh, yeah. jagged edges. Yes, yeah. yes. But the quilter makes it with a square and then uh, uh, folds it like origami in a triangle and 
and uh, edges the edge of the quilt. Right, right. So it's just, it's uh, the, those triangles come back in so many different formats. And this quilt also has those little triangles all around the edge, but what really draws you in is the is the face in the center. So interesting. Uh, black sari is un unauspicious. We in India rarely wear a black sari, but except on the 14th of January every year is a special day called Sankrant, where the sun is in the uh, in. Uh, how you call it, uh, at the bottom of Capricorn. So okay. the the nights are the longest on that particular day. And every Maharashtrian would wear a black sari, including the Maharanis of Kolhapur and Sholapur, but they would have gold uh, sun, chan, chan, sun and moon on it. Uh -huh. So the face is actually an impression of the sun uh, and the rays of the sun. That is the important part of this quilt, the color black and the face of the sun, because that's what indicates the 14th of January every year. So it's a, it's an auspicious quilt again. It's also, um, Bringing good luck to the family, perhaps? Yes, but they would use it only on that particular day. Uh -huh. Right, so a very, and, very special quilt. And I don't think many people would make it, but when I saw this, I had to photograph it. Yeah. And this is similarly uh, meaningful. Uh, to Yes, a meaningful quilt because the lady or the woman who made this quilt added the 12, how you call it now? I guess houses? Her, her, no, her husband was an astrologer. Right. And he would, he would make charts, charts mm -hmm. for uh, newly born babies. We call it Janam Patri. So she added 12 sections, if you notice, in this 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. So she tried to imitate what her husband had made as a chart. Right. And it makes... I'm not so good in explaining. Oh, it's okay. So, yeah, I mean, that, the chart is, is it called the Kundali? Or sometimes called that? Not the Kundali, no. It's, oh, okay, okay. No, but it, no, no. But it's an astrological chart. That's right, it's and an he, astrological. He okay, and he would have used this to help tell the fortune of, of exactly whoever, his client. Of a newborn baby or a, a woman who's getting married or something right. like that. Well, it and it makes for just a really striking quilt. Uh, that we've, <laughs> yes. we've we've seen that format so many times already in Maharashtrian quilts. The the squares just building up around concentric squares building up around each other. But to then overlay that with the astrological chart, I think is just fascinating, and it speaks to the maker's life so directly and so intimately. I think that it's just wonderful. It's maybe my favorite piece in the Gita Candle Wall collection. At the <laughs> International Quilt Museum, so I, I left it for for the very end, as uh, as we move on to uh, another section, because you have been so busy, <laughs> you spent many years documenting quilts, uh, you made your own quilts, you had a business, um, for decades selling quilts um, to various firms in Europe and America, but then. More recently, you were inspired to make miniature costumes. Um, and I know that part of your inspiration was this catalog, uh, a book called Indian Costumes in the Collection of the Calico Museum of Textiles. And of course, the Calico Museum is in Ahmedabad. 
in Gujarat and they have just the most magnificent collection of Indian textiles, whether it's costume or bed coverings or, you know, just printed fabrics. So tell us a little bit about what made you want to make your own miniature versions of the garments you saw in this catalog? I think many years ago, perhaps 10 or 12 years ago, I saw a miniature costume on a stand at a friend's house in Bangkok. It was a Bangkok uh, costume, a Malaysian costume. I was intrigued and it stayed in my memory for all those years. One year when I was convalescing at home after a minor operation, memories came back. So I thought this is a good time to make something small and new while I'm sitting and convalescing. <laughs> I had already the book of costumes from the Calico Museum and I was turning pages and luckily it had graphed patterns as a section of the book. Now that got me all excited and interested I saw that it needed geometry, mathematics, and that is the fundamental necessity to make a miniature garment or any quilt. Mm -hmm. So I had to calculate the graph, the graph, and expand it, or how do you call it, increase the size. Right. Uh, to to about eight or nine inches by calculating the squares and adding uh, more to them. Right. After that, I thought I should look for the fabrics, but I found many of them in my cupboard over the years during my visits to various cities. I had collected fabrics. So I pulled out a brocade material and perhaps this was the beginning of a two or three year study on miniature costumes of the Maharajas of India from 1850 to 2000. Right. And um, as, as I was initially going through your catalog that, that with which features photographs of all of these miniature costumes, I was impressed with the number of modern day uh, states that were represented, Indian states. And of course, um, you know, 200, 300 years ago, India was uh, differently configured. Pakistan was still part of India, but all of these different modern day Indian states are represented by costume in your miniature costume collection. And I love the fact that uh, your miniature costumes really reflect the, the fashion of the Mughal rulers of India. And the Mughals, of course, um, were culturally very aligned with Persia. So Persian motifs, uh, the, the beautiful floral motifs, the booti, the paisleys, all of those come into play uh, in the Mughal uh, costume, the, the high-end fashions that you ended up creating in your miniature garment collection. I think they're, they're just so representative of that era in Indian history, the Mughal Empire. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about each of the, the major styles that you uh, created in your collection. Uh, I know that Jama is a, and this is a drawing from your catalog, uh, The Jama is a garment with a fitted bodice. Uh, and you tie it near the armhole. And what is very distinct about it is the full skirt that it has, uh, which I think is just a very, yeah, very distinctive, very Persian. And here is an example 
of one of the miniature garments you made on the left there, representing a jama from Rajasthan from the late 18th century. And on the right, we actually, in our exhibition of your work, we've included a few historical garments from our own collection, including this robe. Uh, it's either Persian or Indian and, and from the early part of the 19th century. So it was, it was great to be able to have uh, some full-sized garments to compare with the miniature ones that you created. And the miniature one on the left, the Rajasthani garment, um, it looks like it was made using, uh, yeah, some block printed fabric that you, as you said, already had in your collection, which I think is just amazing. And wonderful that you were able to uh, use your own fabrics to create all of these miniature garments. Uh, I wanted to share just a few more examples of the jama, uh, this beautiful, almost turmeric colored fabric on the left, uh, naturally dyed. And the one on the right, I remember seeing in the actual uh, Calico Museum book, uh, I was for, I think it was described as being for a very robust uh, gentleman. It, you can tell that the, the dimensions are quite um, different from some of the other jamas. He's, he seems to be quite wide <laughs> rather than tall. So this jama was uh, especially interesting to me, intriguing to me, uh, commissioned to fit a very specific body type. Um, and then we have a few more jamas here. These are all miniature garments that you made. So what, what was the, I know you talked about having to do the calculation, um, going from the original patterns that they provided in the Calico Museum book and then reducing them in scale so that you could create the miniatures. Was that the most difficult part or what else were the challenges that you faced in making these miniatures? To begin with, you know, over the, uh, in 1850s, the craftsmen who had for generations and for generations and for many years spent in perfecting their skills and their crafts, mm -hmm. I had to match that. So I had to work without a sewing machine uh, and it took time. Mm -hmm. Most difficult part was trying to get the collar and sleeves where I would have to push my little finger in uh, to turn it around and to add the lining to it. Um, also, uh, adding the piping and no buttons but only loops or drawstrings to tie it was for me a new way of stitching the process uh was interesting but time consuming and i had to work with a strong light um, for me, it was also a learning experience. I was a quilter and making garments was entirely new, um, but a big challenge. Yeah. Working so small, as you said, like, I don't think my fingers would function properly at that scale. I just, I'm not sure that I would have the manual dexterity, but your experience as a quilter, I'm sure must have helped at least a little bit. Yes. Uh, I think I was in a trance <laughs> while making these garments. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as you said, you were convalescing and working small when you are convalescing and you can't move around, it, it makes a great deal of sense. <laughs> now this is oh. uh, this is another major type of garment that you recreated, the angarka. It also yes. has the fitted bodice and the full skirt. Those full skirts are just so gorgeous, especially in the photographs where you have them, you know, completely 
um, spread out for uh, for all to see. But the very distinctive part of the angarka is that inner flap um, that covers the the rounded opening, and then it also has exagger exaggeratedly long sleeves, which would then get bunched up, right, and look very very fashionable, I guess, for the time. Um, and again, we were able to include an angarka from our collection, a full-sized one from, um, we think, early 19th century from Jaipur. And it was nice to see that we had a white one uh, that looked oh, very nice. similar to some of the, the all-white angarka that you made. Here are a couple of the uh, just gorgeously detailed Angarka you made. Now, on the one on the left, I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the details here. You talked about the piping being very difficult. Um, yes. And I, I'm also assuming you did all that embroidery. Is that correct? Yes. And imagine men used to wear embroidery yeah. in India. I mean, Maharajas would commission uh, 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 skilled craftsmen to do fine, fine embroidery on their angarkas and jamas. Yes. Incredible. And then on this one, all of the uh, gold wrapped thread included in there, it just, it's so luxurious. Um, it really speaks to the, uh, yeah, royal and aristocratic nature of these garments. I suppose this was formal wear for an audience when they had to uh, give an audience. Right. And here's a, a slide showing um, many more of them. The pattern maker in the book, and I happened to by chance contact her and meet her. When I had completed my costumes, she came to curate them and to find mistakes and to help improve on them. So there was very little that she could really point out. So this was the, the, the pattern the, maker from the original catalog? Yes. Okay. Her name. Uh, she worked for Yves Saint Laurent in Paris for eight or nine years. Of course, she's now an old lady, but she was willing to come and look at the costumes because she had made the patterns and she was thrilled that somebody was actually using them and she could see the costumes that I had made. So the quilted jama had to be uh, drawn mm -hmm. and each panel had to be separately quilted before assembling it. Uh -huh. and, and I think that was one of the most difficult angarkas that I made, but it's exactly the same pattern as in the Calico Book of Costumes. Okay. And of course, the angarki is simply a shorter version of the angarka, correct? That's right. That's right. And the angarki in orange, I have used a gold uh, powder uh, and uh, used a, a wood block to print on the fabric. Ah. Uh, so this came as a plain fabric and then I used a wooden block to print. Um, the wooden block actually came from uh, Anoki's museum in Jaipur. And then we made French knots and a few sequences, etc., etc., to give it a richer look. It's really gorgeous. It's just been uh, fun, uh, fun, I think, a lot of fun to do different things. Yeah, so many different techniques you had to employ. Exactly. 
and I think it kept me alive and <laughs> excited. Right. Uh, uh, part of my good health, yeah. I would owe to to making costumes and enjoying looking for fabrics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It helped you recuperate. <laughs> <laughs> I just yes. wanted to, yeah, I wanted to show just a few more slides of the, the garment styles that were, um, there were fewer of them. The Jama, the Angarka, and the Angarki were the most common, but we also had the, the Choga, which is sort of based on a Central Asian or Turkish robe, and the Sherwani, yes. which I guess would be similar to maybe what historically would have been called a frock coat in the West, and you can see yeah, here are a few examples of those styles. And yes, the one on the right, the Sherwani, definitely has sort of a bit more of a Western flair to it. Were these ones simpler to make or just as difficult? The Sherwani is simpler. Uh, the Choga has also got panels, whereas the Sherwani does not have that many panels. It does, it does. But they are easier to make, I think, than the Chogas and Jamas. Right. And here are some examples of uh, very interesting <laughs> versions uh, of the Sherwani, I think, on the left. But then also, of course, yes. uh, the Cope and Chasuble. Uh, which you wouldn't necessarily associate with India, but of course there were Christian communities, uh, Christian missionaries who came to India. So uh, the, the cope and chasuble Christian garments would have been applicable applicable in certain areas. And the the garment on the right, tell me a little bit more about that. I think it's called the the cholu. Yes, uh, this garment is worn by men in the Himachal Pradesh Chamba area, which is more hilly. It's more rough and they look after goats and sheep. So they wear these hand-woven heavy fabrics, coarse woolen cloths uh, with a very distinctive flair. Uh, it, I think it had 15 panels. Wow. Uh, it had a European collar high to keep them uh, from the wind. Uh, and they wear a, a, a close fitting trouser made of the same coarse natural fabric which they weave at home, the women. Um, there are no uh, tie strings or buttons, but just a rope which keeps the garment together on the waist, rather unusual. And uh, uh, I think it's one of my favorites. Uh -huh. uh, they also have used a, a kind of a embroidery stitch on the seams. These are on the seams, not as decorative, but just to keep the seam together on the okay. shoulder and uh, on the flare oh. rather an interesting garment it is very interesting and i i appreciated the fact that although the majority of your miniature garments are in the sort of the mogul uh, fashion some of these are for more ordinary folks like these these uh shepherds from Himachal yes. Pradesh. i i liked that there was a there was some variety in the garments that you created and just returning to this idea of so many different techniques you had to use. Um, and I, oh, here is a, an image of the pattern you drew, which was based on the patterns from the back, of, from the back half of the Calico Museum catalog. And that just, uh, that amazes me. You did this for every single garment, isn't that right? Yes, yes, I still have them all. <laughs> such I mean so much attention to detail I again I don't think 
I don't think my manual dexterity, I don't know if my brain would even <laughs> be able to handle uh, this much fine, fine work and detail. And that's what I really love about this collection is you can, uh, miniatures in general, draw people in. They, they make you want to look at them. They make you want to explore them in detail. Uh, so this whole collection, I could probably spend, you know, days and weeks at a time just examining them in, the, uh, in, in close detail, zooming in on all of those fine, fine details. And I hope that's what people do in our galleries as well as they look at all of these wonderful miniature garments. What do you think, yeah. how, do you, how do you feel about this project now that it's over? Uh, I would say I'm continuing. Uh, and I realized also that while I was convalescing, that my home has a great significance in my life. The space and the green environment kept providing me with these creative ideas. and creative expressions as i was spending most of my time at home it almost became uh, an indulgence to make these costumes it just kept me on and on and on and i could not stop so in between i did make some dolls quilts now but uh, last week I started to make miniature garments once again. <laughs> so the, the project truly isn't over yet. <laughs> so uh, I don't know why, but I keep going on and on. <laughs> I, I've been so pleased to speak with you today, Gita, about your various projects. You have had such an amazing history of not only making quilts yourself, uh, but running a quilt business and um, documenting quilts from your home state of Maharashtra. And more recently, this love of making miniatures, uh, not just garments, but also miniature quilts. So I have been very pleased to speak with you today about these projects. And I know that you will continue uh, to make beautiful textiles. And I just want to remind our audience that miniature costumes and quilts, Gita Candlewall's Labor of Love is on view until October 14th. Uh, so it will be up all summer long. You'll have many opportunities to come to the Quilt Museum and, and see Gita's wonderful handiwork. So. I just want to thank Gita for being here today, and I want to thank everyone uh, who has tuned into Textile Talks for joining us, and I hope you'll be able to see Gita's handiwork in person at some point later this year. Thank you, everyone. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us today. I wanted to share my screen for just a minute and show you the exhibition, a picture of it, um, so that you could kind of see a little bit in context um, some of the beautiful pieces on the walls. The large pieces are ones in our collection. The smaller pieces are the miniature ones, uh, miniature pieces that Gita mentioned that she was making the miniature crib quilts. And then you can see the full-sized robes down the center of the gallery and her miniature pieces in the plexiglass um, display cases, as we, um, as you, as you can see those on either side. So um, I wanted you to see that um, just so that you could briefly um, have an idea of what that looked like. Again, um, if you go to our website, so www.internationalquiltmuseum.org, and click on exhibitions. Um, the current exhibitions, you can take a 3D tour of this um, exhibition and get a little more ideas on it. Um, we are out of time, but I wanted to let you know that next week we're going to have another awesome textile talk presented by Sakwa.
It is Sharon Peoples, Stitching a Path from the Wall to the Plinth. You'll definitely want to, to see that. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you again to our sponsors and to all of you who tune in every week and who support all of the organizations that present Textile Talks. Hope that you all have a great afternoon wherever you happen to be around the world. And thank you for joining us.